the first two weeks of this series, Mike led us through a discussion of sacred spaces. He talked about the tabernacle and then sacred tools, the furnishings, the things that are in the tabernacle that were used for worship. And we saw a couple of themes. We saw the first theme, that being of holiness. After all, God is infinitely holy and infinitely worthy of our worship. And therefore, the architecture, the design, the materials, the closer you get to the presence of God at the Holy of Holies, the more glorious is the workmanship and the materials. We go from really nice cloth opening the courtyard to the very finest, most expensive material possible in the Holy of Holies, embroidered with incredibly expensive yarns and gold thread. Everything pointing Israel to the incredible holiness of the Lord their God. But, you know, holiness might cause us to think that God is remote and distant and far off, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Because, see, God's desire is for his people to be present with him. And that becomes the second theme that Mike brought out in the first two messages was presence. God desires to be among and with his people. And so, for example, we saw that all of Israel was invited to come into the courtyard. For example, you might come bringing a thank offering to the Lord. And part of that thank offering, that lamb, for example, would be totally consumed in the fire as an offering given to the Lord is his portion. But part of that lamb would be perfectly roasted by the priests and then would be eaten by the worshiper and the priests together in God's presence, enjoying a meal with their heavenly father in his house, right in the middle of town. God's desire is presence with his people. In those first two weeks, we looked at the tabernacle. We looked at its furnishings. Today, we'll begin to look at the priests who were called to sacred service in these sacred places. I invite you, please turn with me to page 68 or to Exodus 28, if you have your own Bible. And we begin reading in verse one, then bring near to you Aaron, your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. Now, you note that, that God doesn't take out a want ad in the paper, help wanted priest. There's no ad in monster.com. There's no call for volunteers. The Lord chooses who will serve him. The Lord chooses Aaron and his sons. Now, how does he make this choice? I'll tell you right now, it's not based on merit. After all, Aaron is the guy in chapter 32 who takes all of the jewelry from the Israelites, melts it down and makes a baby cow statue that they can worship. It's not based on merit. It's based on God's gracious choice, God's kindness. And after all, isn't that the way that it is for us as well? Do any of us come to God, become adopted as his children because of our merit? <laughs> no, quite the opposite. It's based on Christ's merit. It's God's grace that brings us to him, just as God's grace and kindness brought Aaron and his sons into the service as the priests. We turn to verse 2. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. And the text goes on and it describes these, these holy garments. And you'll notice that these holy garments, again, are made of the absolute finest possible materials. No cost is spared, just as was the case with the Holy of Holies, because the high priest is going to enter into the very presence of God, wearing the garments God specifies, in the manner God specifies, at the times God specifies. God has told his people throughout all eternity how he is to be loved and worshiped. For the people of Israel, he lays it out here in the book of Exodus and in the Torah. So they're garments for glory and for beauty. Why? 
again, because it reflects the beauty and the glory of the God who is being worshiped by the priest. It's just the very faintest glimmer of the glory of God, no matter how beautiful and amazing these garments were. And there's a, a second century BC letter that's been preserved in which an observer describes the high priest's garments and says that they are so exquisite that one's breath is taken away. So these are mind-bogglingly beautiful garments. And we read about them. As you jump forward to verse 6, we read about the ephod. It's kind of like an, an apron, if you will, that the high priest wears. We see that it's made again out of gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, skillfully worked. Only the very finest, best materials and the greatest craftsmanship is used. Again, because the high priest is entering into the presence of God. On that ephod, we find gemstones. And we start in verse 9. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves Cygnus, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree. So what's going on here? I think there are three things. First of all, the materials. Again, expensive, exquisite gemstones set in the most beautiful, carefully crafted filigree representing the glory of God to the people. Secondly, the names of the tribes are engraved on these stones so that as the high priest who alone is allowed and only once a year to go into the Holy of Holies, into God's very presence on his shoulders, by proxy, he brings with him all of God's people into the glorious presence of the God who loves them, who rescued them from slavery, and who desires for them to be in his presence. But I think there's yet a third aspect to it. It says something about God's people, the fact that their names are engraved on these precious stones. And I think this is because of Deuteronomy 7, 6. In Deuteronomy 7, 6, the Lord says, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all of the peoples who are on the face of the earth, did you hear that? They're his treasured possession. And it's not because of their merit. The text goes on and continues to explain, but it's simply because of God's goodness and his grace and his great love. So we have the onyx stones, which again remind us of the people being brought into the presence of God. Sliding forward to verse 15, we come across the breast piece of judgment, which is also made of extremely fine materials. It's a piece of cloth and mounted to it are 12 gemstones, four rows of stones, and the stones are described to us. The stones, again, are set in the finest gold filigree. And in verse 21, we read that these stones shall be associated with the names of the sons of Israel. They're like signets, each engraved with his name. Again, so that the high priest brings the people into God's presence with him whenever he goes to minister before the Lord and whenever he encounters the Lord's presence in the Holy of Holies. In verse 31, this idea of graded holiness, of glory of God, again, is reflected in the priest's raiment. The robe is made all of blue. Now, blue dye, oh my heavens, this is expensive, expensive stuff. The most expensive dye possible. The, the dye was extracted from glands in snails. It would take thousands and thousands of snails and incredible amounts of labor to get enough dye for a single garment. So uh, needless to say, uh, normal folk like us would not have had this kind of fabric. It reflects again, the incredible glory of God, not 
the glory of the priest, but the glory of the Lord who is being served by the priest. The robe's description continues in verse 33. On its hem, you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns about its hem with bells of gold between them. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. I think the pomegranates are probably pointing us back to a time of perfect fellowship, perfect enjoyment of God's presence. Life in the garden before we sinned. Before, because of Adam's sin, we all became sinners by nature. And because of that sin, it became impossible for sinful people to be in God's presence. And hence, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. And this is actually an act of God's kindness to have them leave the garden because they could not have survived his glorious presence. You see, as we learn in verse 35, it's dangerous for sinful people to enter into the presence of the holy God. The bells are there, verse 35, it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, so that he does not die. The Lord specifies in the scripture who may enter into the holy place and under what circumstances. Nothing has changed. The Lord still makes that specification. How is it we enter into his presence now? It's by the blood of Christ Jesus shed on the cross for us, who we exalted in song this morning. That perfect high priest whose name is love, who intercedes for me. The rules have been set as to how God's presence is entered and nothing has changed. It's still dangerous for one who does not trust in Christ to enter into the presence of God. That happens on the great and terrible day of the Lord at the end of times when there are two outcomes. Those who trust in Jesus, who are clothed in his righteousness, will enjoy his presence forever. Those who do not, who have rejected Christ, will experience condemnation. The final element of the high priest's garments, um, strangely enough, turns out is not a bow tie. Um, I got here this morning and, and Rob Goddard rebuked me. He said, Eric, you're not wearing holy garments. You don't have a bow tie. It's like, oh, guilty. So now it's not a bow tie. It turns out it's a turban, um, which apparently is not in vogue in among New Testament members of God's people, but that's fine. Verse 36, you shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of signet, holy to the Lord, and you shall fasten it onto the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. You know, the first time I remember reading that, my thought was, well, that's kind of audacious. Um, is the priest saying, oh, I'm holier than thou? Is this an aspect of, of the priest having a big head? Full of himself? No. We have to understand what the word holy means. Holy simply means set aside for God's particular use. This golden plate is not proclaiming that the high priest is better than everybody else, more moral, more righteous than everybody else. And we already talked about the fact that, for example, Aaron made a baby cow out of gold for the people to worship. His sons, two of them, choose to worship God in an unauthorized way, rebelling against God's command for how he's to be worshiped, and they die as a result. Caiaphas, the high priest in the days of Jesus, wears that very sign on his head, and he rejects the Messiah and takes him to Pilate, demanding that he be crucified. So the plate 
does not make one holy. The plate simply declares that the person, the priest, is set aside for God's particular use. This plate, by the way, I think is very relevant for us today. I think metaphorically, y'all each have your own invisible, but metaphorical gold plate that says holy to the Lord. And I say this in part because of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, which I'll read for you. But you, and Peter's writing to Christians, this is not Old Testament stuff, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Do you hear that? Set aside as God's treasured possession. Each and every one of you, modern day, new covenant, royal priesthood. Why has God done this? Peter continues, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So through trusting in Christ as your savior, you become part of God's new covenant, royal priesthood. And you therefore have been set aside for his particular use holy to the Lord and invited into his presence. In verse 40, we see that garments will also be made for Aaron's sons. They, after all, are also priests. They're not yet the high priest. One of them will serve as high priest after Aaron dies. But for Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. And again, you shall make them for glory and for beauty. And you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him. And you shall anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. This word consecrate, not a word that we use commonly in everyday speech. What does it mean? In Hebrew, it's simply the verb form of the word holy. So holy is an adjective. God is holy. It's the verb of holy. So consecrate means to, to holy somebody, to make them holy, to proclaim that they are set aside for God's particular use. These holy garments we read in verse 43 are to be on Aaron and his sons when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near to the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. So we've had this wonderful set of passages about the holy garments worn by the high priest worn by the priests when serving the Lord God in the tabernacle, when entering into his very presence in the most holy place. And as I mentioned earlier, things that we learn from this are, first of all, that God, as I said, sets the terms by which he is worshipped. He set the terms by which Aaron and his sons would minister. The garments they would wear, the things that they would do, how they would be allowed into his presence. As we've expressed, this has nothing to do with their merit. I mean, after all, Aaron made the calf. It's based on God's grace that they are allowed into his presence. And by the way, being allowed into God's presence isn't based upon wearing Sunday go to meet and clothes. It was not based upon the garments that they were required, but that was not what actually did it. Because you see, a person can put on holy garments, can be stunning and exquisite and glorious in appearance on the outside, but there is still 
a problem. That problem is that person's sin nature and that person's individual sins. And we see examples of this throughout Scripture in Leviticus chapter 10. As I mentioned, two of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, God has told them exactly how he is to be worshipped, exactly the type of incense, exactly how it's to be done. They're like, nah, we're going to do it our way. That's just boring. So they worship God in an unauthorized way, and they die as a result of this presumptuous sin. The clothes did not make the men. Their hearts were rebellious, were not right with God. Jesus makes this exact same point in Matthew chapter 23. He rebukes in the strongest possible words, the Pharisees. He says, woe to you. That's a word of of judgment. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also, Pharisees, outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. It takes more than a suit of fancy clothes to enter into the presence of God. There's an interesting story about the priest's garments that illustrates this beautifully and provides us the solution. It's in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter three. If you want to join me there, it's on page 794. It's an interesting vision. So this is now some thousand years after the instructions for the priest's garments have been given. The high priest in the days of Zechariah, the prophet is a man named Joshua. And in Zechariah's vision, it's a vision of the throne room of God. God is present, reigning. The high priest appears. And in verse 3, Joshua was standing before the angel of the Lord, clothed with filthy garments. The ESV is is giving us sort of a, uh, a polite translation. What the text actually says is that his robes are smeared with excrement. He is filthy beyond description. The odor must be intense. It is exactly the opposite of the kind of holiness, of purity, of beauty, of glory that was instructed in Exodus 28. Yes? And by the way, Satan is standing there in the holy courtroom in this vision, accusing Joshua, look at him. He deserves to die. What happens? In verse four, the angel of the Lord, who the angel of the Lord typically is the phrase used for the pre-incarnate son of God. So it is God, the son, present making these statements. He says to those who are standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. Joshua's sins, his personal unholiness, his unrighteousness is taken away from him. He's cleansed. And then the Lord says, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you. And I will clothe you with pure vestments. The Lord removes the problem. The Lord solves it. The Lord takes away the filthy garments, cleansing Joshua, making him fit to be in God's presence, making him fit for service. And the Lord then clothes him with pure vestments. And and again, the the underlying text, the implications of of the wording are so much richer. That word that's translated here as pure, perhaps rich or 
or overwhelmingly glorious is used only in two places. The other place is in Isaiah 61, where we see that the Lord has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness, just as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Joshua comes before the Lord clothed with his own deeds, his own sinless, his own sinful unworthiness, much like the song that we sang just before the sermon. The Lord graciously takes that all away, cleanses him, clothes him with robes of righteousness. It's not just an Old Testament vision, by the way. It's a prophetic vision that has to do with us as God's New Testament people. Because you see, as Paul writes in Galatians 3.27, all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourselves with Christ. What are the garments that we wear when entering into God's presence? It's not a fancy suit, not blue robes. We're clothed with Christ Jesus, with the very son of God who loved us, who died for us. And as a result of that in verse seven, the Lord tells Joshua that he will be given the right of access. Access? Yeah, access into the presence of God. As we mentioned, the high priest had this right of access once a year. On Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. But as Hebrews 4 puts it, we, because of Jesus, our great high priest, are able to draw near to the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because of Christ, because you are clothed in Christ, you don't have to go to the Holy of Holies, walk into a tent somewhere, a good thing because it doesn't exist, nor does the temple, because we don't need them. The presence of God, which was available to Israel through the tabernacle, you experience day in and day out as the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Last week, Mike said that the elements, the items, the furnishings of the tabernacle were kind of a trailer, a, a short and exciting and interesting bit of film that caused you to yearn for the feature film. And that was really a great metaphor, and it works today as well, because you see the Old Testament priesthood is a type. It's something that points forward. It's a preview of what God had planned for the New Testament priesthood of all believers, for every single one of you who trusts in Jesus as your Savior. 1 Peter 2.5, Peter says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. That would be called a temple. To be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So you see, the Old Testament priests in chapter 29 in the ordination are washed and cleansed with water from that big bronze basin of water in the courtyard. But you have been washed with the Holy Spirit. They put on holy garments made by human hands. But you are clothed with Christ Jesus himself. They could enter the Holy of Holies, but once a year and only under very specific rules. By contrast, the Holy Spirit dwells 
within you all the time. As the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 28, behold, he is with you always. The news actually gets better, though. Not only do we already have a better experience than they did, but we look forward to an even greater one. What we have right now even is just a trailer of what is yet to come as we look forward to Christ's return and to dwelling with him forever in his presence and serving him as a royal priesthood for all of eternity. Amen. We pray with me. Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, your word is so precious. I marvel at how the Old and the New Testament weave together into this beautiful tapestry, a cloth that is far finer even than that was used for the high priest's robes a tapestry that shows us the story of how you have purposed to redeem a people for yourself, to dwell with you in your presence, enjoying your presence and your goodness forever. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Christ Jesus, our Savior, by whom we are able to come to you. It's in his name we pray. Amen.